Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. But Mr. Beast made a new video. <laughs> no, Mr. Beast. <laughs> Not in my classroom. Today, we're here to talk about why the Zonai are definitely 110% the Twilight. There is no room for error. I am correct. I mean, I'm a little bit more sure if he's going to be like 111%. Shut up. No more talking out of turn. All right. I have my, my lesson notes here. All right. So first, we got to cover a little bit of ground. You. Did you laptop remember? So first, we got Zelda's Rules of Three. Now, throughout all the Zelda games, at least all the ones that make any kind of sense, Zelda has followed a rule of threes. Whether it be the Triforce, which has three pieces, or the you the things. What kind of teacher's assistant are you? You're the worst teacher's assistant on the entire planet. I'm the best, and you know this. I'm the best at what I do. Anyway, where was I? Whether it be the spirit stones, the orbs, or the pieces of the fused shadow you have to gather, there is the spirit of the hero. Snap my fingers. Go to the next one. I did. Okay. <laughs> I get clear. You're like... <laughs> anyway. The spirit of the hero, the blood of the goddess, or the hatred of the demon, there is... Ah. What? I, I will kill you. I will kill you. You're... I assign you extra homework. You're now the you're worst. Teacher's assistant. Yeah, that you're still a student. <laughs> uh, or the three golden goddesses. The games, so long as they've had like kind of a pseudo canon that they followed, which means not the first two, because those first two did not really have any story, <laughs> save for like do the things and the game hates you as we have proven in our series. But yes, rule of threes have always been very, very important. I will, point, I, will point, I will point at you. You don't need to be leaned forward constantly. I'll point at you anytime I want you to change it for you two to have something to look at. Wait, Bad teacher's assistant. Are you recording that? No, oh. it's for you to look at. I already explained. I'm gonna put it up for the people. Which they will have already seen. Oh. But you're a bad teacher's assistant, so you don't remember. I thought I was a student. You're both. Teacher's assistants are often students. I was a student teacher, and that made me the teacher's assistant once. I'm going to be a junior year. Well, there you go. You should understand this concept. If you're going to do this kind of performance, I don't think you're going to last very long. They're going to they're gonna chew you up and spit you out. Anyway, so yes, the rule of threes have always been followed. That's very important to the Zelda franchise. Rule of threes constantly followed. Next thing that's really important for setup is the importance of eyes. Now, eyes have been used for various things in the Zelda series a ton. Whether it be the Shika eye symbols or it be the uh, colors of eyes. For example, the Shika. What? Yeah, that's why I pointed at you again. Do the next one. Oh. <laughs> the Sheikah all have red eyes. This is a consistent trait all members of the Sheikah tribe have. They all have red eyes. Now the Gerudo, on the other hand, he's just assistant, all have yellow eyes and have consistently had yellow eyes throughout the series. The only difference in this has been recently, in which. There we go. Bruh. It's only been recently in Breath of the Wild, in which now the Gerudo not only have different colors of eyes, but their ears are pointy. And that actually brings. I didn't point at you. I will literally do this when I want you to go to the next slide. You bad teacher's assistant, bad. No! Go back. Ah! Anyway, anyway. So, 
Where the hell was that? <laughs> anyway, up until very recently, they have pointy ears now. Now, this, I think, is their way of going from, you know, gold eyes, round ears, to now different colored eyes and pointy ears, of showing that over the wide span of time that's supposed to have happened before Breath of the Wild, that the Gerudo, due to their being a fully female-only tribe and having to go and get men from other races to have children with, have started to take on Hylian traits. We can see that in the pointy ears and the different color eyes, but also there are some Gerudo that don't have copper-colored skin anymore. They have very pale skin, like Hylians. So I think that's kind of something we're meant to interpolate, uh, to kind of take note of. However, now, that, that's, all, that's all this out of the way. Now we're in to the big boy stuff. That is the... Have you pressed the thing? Okay. The Shika, the Yiga, the Zonai, and the Twi'lai. You see, there are also technically three Shika-related tribes. Now, the Shika, the ones we know and love... They've been through the series for quite a while now, actually. But the Yiga have only come into being recently, and that is in Breath of the Wild. They are a splinter tribe. No. <laughs> they are a splinter tribe that broke off a dude. I will literally point to you <laughs> like this. When I'm gestating, I'm gestating. Or gesticulating, yes. I gestated a long time ago, for a little bit too long. What's gestated mean? Well, you see, when a mommy and a daddy love each other very much, they have a baby, and when the baby's forming inside the mother's womb, that's gestation. For all those not in the know, Connor, right here, and my other brother Aiden, forever now, when I go up to them and say, I have a question for you, will do this thing where they're like, well, when a mommy and a daddy love each other very much, and finally I got to bring it back at them, but with the actual context. I feel euphoric in this moment. Anyway, when I'm gesticulating, I'm gesticulating. When I point at you, next slide. Not yet. You fucking creep. Anyway, in Breath of the Wild, we find that there is a second... Shika tribe, and that is the Yiga. They splintered off from the Shika because they are followers of Ganon, whereas the Shika themselves are followers of Zelda, or the Blood of the Goddess. No. <laughs> Seriously, I will literally point at your ass. I will literally do this when I want you to go to the next slide. I'm not ready yet! <laughs> anyway, so we got two there. We got the Shika. Blue is kind of their signature color, and they follow the blood of the goddess. They are always followers and helpers of the Princess Zelda, who, being representative of wisdom, is represented by the color blue. The Yiga splintered off. They wanted to be followers of Ganon. Their associated color is red, like power, which is the associated aspect of Ganon. But that leaves a third thing going on there. A green color, the color of courage, representative of the spirit of the hero, or just the Triforce of Courage in general. And what we've seen with the Zonai, especially in the most recent trailers, is that, not yet, <laughs> especially in the most recent trailers, is that they have green energy color, kind of blue-green energy. No. <laughs> They had a blue-green energy, and that is one, one, one little thing, it doesn't seem like much, but we've also seen in the most recent trailers, where we have gotten some information, this symbol heavily associated with, I'm not pointing at you, don't do the next thing. Some of these points are going to be long and short, kid. You gotta, you gotta work on the fly if you're going to be my teacher's assistant. Eh. Anyway, <laughs> that's where we come to this symbol. We have seen this symbol 
a few times throughout the trailer, and always in association with the Zonai. And that would mean that the Zonai are a third splinter group from the Sheikah. But that's where we get into... Sorry, everyone knows, the camera really sucks. <laughs> and it's messed up again. Anyway, I was... Oh, yes. So we have the Sheikah, the, Z the Yiga, and the Zonai. Each of them has their own unique eye symbol. We got the standard cheek eye, the yiga in, is inverted, and then we have this eye symbol, which shares a lot of similarities but a lot of differences. The first big similarity is that it has the eyelashes that all the shika symbols tend to have, as well as what appears like a teardrop. But this one has multiple, but that could just be a stylistic choice by the Zonai clan. Now, it may be strange you know, accept that as being a different Splinter Sheikah group when we don't have any information directly saying, like we do in Breath of the Wild, that the Zonai splintered off from the Sheikah group long, long ago. But that said, we have a previous game that goes over a very similar kind of idea. In Twilight Princess, the game which we were first introduced to the Twilight, we see that the Twilight were once people who lived in the sacred realm with normal Hylians. But they coveted the power of the Triforce and wanted to take the sacred realms for themselves, and then were therefore banished from the sacred realm, just kind of flumped away by the light spirits. We don't ever see the Twilight in their form before they became corrupted by the Twilight Realm. But what we do see is three representations of what they may have been. And these representations had red eyes. And the Twilight themselves continued to, even in their altered forms, possess red eyes. Now, this may be the thing where you're just like, oh, well, maybe they just, you just have red eyes. But in Twilight Princess, there is a sole surviving Sheikah member we do see who does have red eyes. No other characters in the whole of that game have red eyes. So, we can either say that the Zelda team for once made a giant coincidence in their choice of eye color, or we can take into account the fact that on the back of the fused shadow is a picture of an eye. So, they are also a Sheikah tribe splinter group. But that would break the rule of threes. Now, one thing that is very key to note is that there is a color palette choice when it comes to the Twilight, and they have a blue-green energy color. It's on their skin, and it shows in their technology and architecture. And now, I'm going to bring it around to another kind of big connection between specifically the Sheikah the Zonai, and the Twilight, and that is their connection to shadows. Now, the first two ones being the Sheikah and the Twilight, very easy to see their connection to shadows. In Ocarina of Time, a member of the Sheikah race, Impa, is the Sage of Shadows, and the one who grants Link the Shadow Medallion and is in charge of the Temple of Shadows, which we do find through lore bits was a training ground for members of the Sheikah tribe. The Twi'lei, their big crime, the thing that got them banished from the Sacred Realm, and the thing they used to try and subvert the power of the Triforce was the Fused Shadow. So we see a shadow connection there. Each play with shadows quite a bit. Where's the Zonai connection to shadows? Well, that is one particular shrine, known as the Shrouded Shrine. A shrine full of so much darkness and intrinsically connected to the Zonai because it's full of Zonai ruins that even from the outside, it has a thick layer of shadows all around it. Now, if my theory that the Zonai and the Twilight are one and the same, whether one became the other or the other is a result of the other, that could be the birth ground of the Fused Shadow. 
It took so much darkness and magic to make it that it has permanently cursed this area with eternal darkness, choking out all of the light. Yes. But in the Breath of the Wild, or in the Tears of the Kingdom trailer, we saw that the darkness was gone. It wasn't there anymore. Yes, and that is actually a very good question there. If that area was permanently choked with darkness from something the zone I did, why in the trailer is that shadow gone? What we also see in these trailers is that it seems like the Zonai, on some level, have come back. We see enemies that are Zonai constructs dropping Zonai charges, and we see more Zonai technology and Zonai architecture floating in the Sky Islands. So perhaps, when they came back, it had something to do with breaking that shadow curse, or when they came back, they alleviated it because they needed something there. But... That connection is undeniable. Because, yes, Zonai Ruins being there and it also having a shadowy curse on it could be completely unrelated. But the fact that the curse seems gone and the Zonai seem back would indicate that the Zonai had something to do with it. Or it directly has something to do with the Zonai. And thus, their connection to the shadows is kind of shown there, I'd like to think. Yeah, yeah. Zonai, shadow connections, other Sheikah tribe. Descendants, Shadow Connections, yes. That brings us to the next bit. The Zonai's connection to the Twilight, directly. Now, the first big one is, in Breath of the Wild, there is a town, which seems to be full of descendants of the Zonai. Zonai who didn't disappear. We can see this in that on the symbol... Uh, the, on various houses, there's a symbol, which we also find on many Zonai structures, which is the swirl-looking symbol. But right near this town, there is a mirror. A mirror that strikes a st stunning resemblance to the Mirror of Twilight from Twilight Princess, which was the interlock between the Twilight Realm and the Realm of Hyrule, which was shattered at the end. But if, per se, the Zonai are the Twi'lei, but back in Hyrule, and now uncorrupted for having spent time in Hyrule, perhaps a new mirror needed to be constructed. Or maybe this is meant to kind of show that the Zonai, or the Twi'lei themselves, always had this kind of mirror magic at their disposal. And then that's where we get to the next bit, the interlopers. Now, in Twilight Princess, as I already discussed, when the Light Spirits speak about the Twi'lei before they were cast into the Twilight Realm, they refer to them as the interlopers. And what kind of show, Link is given this vision of how it all went down, how originally Hylians and all the races existed in the Sacred Realm with the Triforce as kind of this golden light in the middle of it. But the interlopers decided that they wanted to subvert this power, and then were cast off into it. The only thing we know about the interlopers other than that is that they were very powerful magic users, and were considered, you know, evil and violent. Other than that, the only other thing we know is that they were cast away. They just kind of, boom, vanished from the round, just suddenly, like overnight, poof, gone. We know this to be the result of the Light Spirits, banishing them to what became the Twilight Realm. The Zonai, however, we also know, existed a long time ago, were also very powerful and called savage wielders of magic. Often had conflicts with Hyrule, but then, suddenly, they disappeared. Just out of the blue. We don't know what happened to them. Yes. Never mind. Okay. Think about your question before you ask it. So, we have this connection here too. Just like how their descendants also have this mirror structure near them, the Zonai as a big civilization were very powerful magic wielders, just like the Twilight. Yes? Uh, I think I might have another connection to the Zonai and Sheikah. Okay. We're kind of past that point in the lecture. Uh, every game where there's a big presence of the Sheikah, there are re-deads. 
in Wind Waker and in uh, Ocarina of Time, you found Redeads in Sheikah areas. Not necessarily. In Wind Waker, the Redeads appear in a few just different areas that are not wholly related to the Sheikah. But, understood. And in the trailer for Tears of the Kingdom, there were shown to be Redeads seemingly appearing. I kind of get what you're going for, but the Sheikah were in all of Breath of the Wild, and no Redead. So I don't think this connection is quite so important to my theory here. But, alright. You've, you've knocked me off my game. What was I talking about? Oh, yes, the interlopers. So, we have the Twi'lai, who are powerful magic wielders went against the ways of the sacred realm and, you know, the gods, and then they were sealed away, cast aside, and suddenly disappeared, as far as everyone who wasn't aware of the story is concerned. The Zonai were also very powerful magic wielders, warred with Hyrule, and then disappeared, almost just immediately, leaving all of their structures and ruins. And now, we're going to get to some of the more really, really solid connections here. And that is the Zonai and Twi'lai art and architecture, because there are a lot of very, very similar looks to their architecture. So big thing first, we're going to get to the Zonai. The Zonai had a lot of, they have a lot of swirls in their architecture, just this kind of pattern of a swirling, well, just a swirl, honestly. But the other thing they have a lot of is dragons. Lots and lots of dragon imagery. Dragons, as far as the eye can see. The other thing, though, is that the Twi'lai also have a lot of swirls in their art and architecture, as well as dragons, which appear on the fused shadow, as well as a lot of other things. But then, here is my, uh, my Bigger thing. Oh, yeah. Next one. The helmet, actually. There you go, I guess. So, that's kind of surface level. You know, swirls can be used in other things. Now, that said, we don't see the swirling pattern in any other architecture other than the Twilight and the Zonai, but it could just be a coincidence, though I don't think so. This is where the kind of bigger connection comes in. So, in one of the trailers, a few of them actually, we see this Zonai hill art. Now, this isn't a very good view of it right here, but we do have a bit of a benefit. Unfortunately for Nintendo, one of their art books for this upcoming game leaked, and while I have avoided looking at it, I did find one of the cover pages when I was trying to find a better look at the Zonai line art. And so here we can see a much better look at what the line art is meant to be. Now, when you look at this, I want you to pay really close attention to the head of this thing. The head is the bigger part of my point here at the similarities in the art. Now we're going to go to the headpiece of Midna when she's in her true form, uh, what a Twilight is meant to look like uncorrupted. Look at that hairpin right there. Just, Just a quick look. And now I will show it side by side. The hairpin that is on the headdress looks remarkably similar to the creature depicted in the line art from the hills. Almost to a point where they can't be talking about different creatures. It has to be referencing a similar figure in the mythology of both of these people, which would make no sense, none at all, if they didn't have some overarching connection. This isn't like... The kind of look like dragons, but they're more like worms that are on a lot of their architecture, versus the more Aztec Mesopotamian uh, dragon sculptures of the Zonai. This is a clear back and forth. On the princess of the Twilight people, she has this headdress. And on their hill art lines, they depict this creature. And this creature has not appeared in any other Zelda game thus far. 
So why do these two different peoples from different games have the same mythological depiction of this strange creature with the, la the large jaw? Unless they're one and the same. And that will bring me to the next couple bits, which is the advanced Magitek of both the Zonai and the Twilight. Now, the reason I say ma Magitek is because it's not exactly technology. These things aren't powered by electricity or gasoline. They're powered by magic. And so I say Magitek. So, when it comes to the Zonai, we don't have a lot of imagery for their Magitek, save for what we've seen in the trailers for this new game. Firstly is the sealed arm put on Ganon, and it gives off this very distinct green energy which turns more green the further it bleeds away, but at its source is this kind of tealy blue-green. We can see this again in the magic arm once wielded by Link. Whenever it's on him and he's using it, it, blow, it glows a tealy green color and extrudes a tealy green energy that gets greener the further away it gets from him. Now if we go to the Twilight Realm, we see that their magic platforms and floating things are powered by a teal green energy. And if we go to the Wallmaster device they have, it also appears to be powered by a blue green energy, which we can see on the wall that it comes out of. Now, again, it could be coincidence that these two beings, these two different races of people, that seem very similar and have lots of other connections, also both have magic, which is the same color. Or more realistically, if they are the same people, of course their magic would have the same color. And now we're going to get into the direct ties that Tears of the Kingdom, the upcoming game, has to Ocarina of Time and Breath of the Wild, or, uh, and Twilight Princess. Now, the first big thing is the mural. The mural depicts seven tiers. Now, seven tiers may seem like a very arbitrary number, except when you consider the fact that in Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, by extension, there are seven sages. The seven sages are very important figures. Some of them represent kind of elemental or spiritual aspects, and then Zelda herself represents time, yes? Aren't there six sages, though? There's seven. Six ones with medallions, and Zelda is the seventh sage, the Sage of Time. This is very specific and very important, because I've seen a lot of other people get this wrong. Because there's some people who think that Zelda and another character both have the same tier. But I disagree, because the tier on the second character we have not seen the symbol on. But I'll get to some more about Zelda's tier. So... First, we've got to get the tier colors of the tiers we've seen. So far, we've confirmed four tier colors, like 100% confirmed, irrefutable. There is a blue tier held by Sidon, a member of the Zora race. There is a green tier held by... Uh, Neva? No, his name starts with a T. It's like... Neva? No, it's the sun. Now you see the issue? I don't remember the sun's name. Anyway, holding a green tier, no, we have the descendant of the Gerudo champion holding an orange tier, and then we have the yellow tier held by the mysterious girl we've only seen in trailers and have no name for. Now if we go to the next one, I will show you those compared to the medallions that they seem to represent from Ocarina of Time. We see that there is a blue medallion representing water, which previously was held by the Zora Princess, now by the Zora Prince, holding this tear that seems to represent water. We have the green medallion representing wind, originally held by the Kokiri, but it wasn't a nature medallion, it was a wind medallion in the Wind Temple, which was said to be an ancient place long forgotten deep in the Lost Woods. It's not held by a Kokiri now, but it's held by a Rito, a race much more associated with the wind. We have an orange medallion representing spirit, like the spirit medallion. Uh, sorry, an orange medallion representing spirit, 
which is originally held by a Gerudo, which is now held by another Gerudo in the form of a tear. And then we have this yellow, golden medallion, just like the medallion of light. And the only thing we've seen this mysterious character do is fire a beam of light from her hand. Now, getting to the, uh, yeah, go, go to the next one. So, we got the seven sages here. That, that, that's the seven sages, whole dealio. So, seven sages, there were the sages of water, fire, wind, shadow, spirit, and, time, or, and light, right? But then there was the sage of time, Zelda. Now, a lot of people, Connor included, it seems, thought that there were six sages. But there are only six sages you need to help. The seventh sage is Zelda, who is the sage of time. Now... Zelda, we've seen, also has a yellow tear, like this mysterious girl, which is why everyone thinks that it's the same tear. But specifically, I've tried to get a... I've looked at it several different ways. Every shot we get of this girl, we can't really clearly make out the symbol on her tear. But we do get a very clear shot of the symbol on Zelda's tear, which is exactly the same as the symbol of the ability Link uses in the trailer to turn back time, the recall symbol. And if that symbol has anything to do with time, and it's also on the tier, that is not the tier of light, it is the tier of time, which would make it make sense that Zelda's holding it. She is the seventh sage, and she is the sage of time. Now, this is where we're going to kind of go a little bit more off the beaten path. I don't have really many more slides for this, so this is mostly going to be me talking. The next point is that Midna is an eighth sage. Now, Midna is the princess of the twilight. Now, why this eighth sage thing? That's for a good reason. In Ocarina of Time, where you see something about most of the sages, maybe including Zelda, but not necessarily including them, that there are certain qualities that make a sage. One is a great desire to protect their people and protect the world at large of Hyrule. But the second one is that all of them died. Every single one of the sages was a spirit by the time Link found them. And that seems to be deeply connected to how they were able to fully become a sage. Midna, at the end of Twilight Princess, dies. Or so it seems. Most people will go through the game and assume that she didn't actually die, but the curse was broken on her, and she just came back to her normal self. But I don't think that Ganon gently knocked her out, took the helmet off her head, and then broke it in front of Link and Zelda just for giggles. He most likely killed her and took the helmet as a trophy. Because when we see her again at the end, she appears as her kind of normal self, but surrounded by the light spirits. And then when we get to her, she's her full self again. Now, the light spirits have been shown to have a great deal of influence over the world. We're not really given an explanation of Ocarina of Time of why the sages are chosen, other than just they kind of met the requirements, or maybe they were in the right place at the right time. But it's possible that a force beyond things that was a direct intermediary between the goddesses and Hyrule chose them. Like the light spirits, who, rather than the goddesses exiling the interlopers from the sacred realm, it was the light spirits who did it. So what if it's the light spirits who pick sages? Another thing to note is that one of the sages, yes? Isn't one of the sages a sage of light, though? Yes. What does that have to do with anything? Well, what if the sages of light chose sages, why would there be a... I didn't say the sages of light. There's spirits of light. Oh. Right. You know, the monkey... And the snake, and the ram. Oh, all right. <laughs> Sorry. Pay attention to the games, especially if you're going to be asking me questions like that. You, you're gonna, 
You're getting detention after this. No. Yes. Anyway, so no. The Sages of Light might be a pseudo-intermediary between the goddesses and Hyrule, rather than the goddesses continually interacting with Hyrule. Because what we also learn in Ocarina of Time is that after they created Hyrule and left, it left behind the Triforce. It doesn't say it like they did it on purpose, but just that it came to be as they exited. So it's quite possible that if the goddesses directly intercede in the world, it has great consequence. And so they created intermediaries. Now, in the game, there are three main light spirits. In Breath of the Wild, we also have three spirits. They're dragons, though, and they each bear a name similar to the goddess they represent. This could just be me pulling this out of my ass. But I think these are our game's representation of the spirits that are kind of the intermediaries between the gods and Hyrule. And this can't be made much more clear than the fact that they come in and out of sky portals and descend into the world. Right? That's strange. They're like, and when they go through, they literally disappear. People have glitched their way to get higher. You can get higher than that, like, skybox area. They just disappear in the cloud. <laughs> so, where are they going? Maybe they're going back to the sacred realm. That's not super related, except for one key thing. The reason that I'm trying to make the big point that Midna is the eighth sage here. And th there's no more slides, I told you. Oh, I thought you said meant like there aren't that many more. No, I said there's zero. No, I'm gesticulating now, and I can point at you more now because you don't have this job. Bad listening kid. Too busy eating cashews and drinking my water. Anyway. The big reason I'm trying to get this point out, that Midna is an Eighth Sage, is not just because other people have had this theory before, due to her seeming death and rebirth at the hands of the Light Spirits, but also because there is a very specific area in Breath of the Wild, a set of statues called the Seven Heroine. Now, on each of these several heroine is a symbol which corresponds pretty closely to the spirit medallions, in both color and in shape. And it's sold to be the story of how, once upon a time, seven people came together to save Hyrule. Just like in Ocarina of Time, seven people came together to save Hyrule, to seal Ganondorf away. But there is actually an eighth statue. There's an eighth statue cast far away, no one knows about, and there's a couple very particular things about this. Another thing we see in this trailer is this mural that depicts a character who looks much like Zelda and a character who looks like this strange, tall, pointy ear, almost bestial guy. And each of them holds forward a tear to each other as they interlock their hands. And these tears are mirrored in shape. The eighth heroine statue, for whatever reason, and this has to be a deliberate choice because it fits into that spot no matter which way you put it, all the textures on it and all of the model is mirrored. Now, this could mean a number of things, but here's what I think it means. It's talking about an eighth sage, one that exists behind a mirror. At the end of the game, once Midna is revived, as I theorize, as an eighth sage, she goes back to the realm of twilight, back to the realm beyond the mirror. And so, maybe in a symbolic way, when these statues were created, they also mirrored the statue to differentiate it from the other ones, and kept it further away, like this eighth sage is further away. Because Midna's final act is to destroy the mirror of twilight to make sure that the Realm of Twilight can no longer interfere with Hyrule. Yes? Um, not 
not knowing a ton about the series, Mm -hmm. but merely working off of the symbolism, we're talking about the the Zonai being this new group in the new game, is that correct? No, the Twi'lai are the new group, the Zonai. Okay. Or vice versa. So the symbol that you have there. Yes. Who's that? Whose symbol is that? This is, as far as we know, the Zonai symbol. Okay. So, just symbolism-wise, if you look at the literal tiers, Mm -hmm. there are seven of them coming from the bottom, and the eye above all tiers. Yep. So I think that that might be a symbolistic choice as well. That's something I thought of, too. Specifically because what we've seen in a lot of the Sheikah symbols is that the tier kind of gets lower and lower as the games have but progressed. But single tiers on But it's a other. single tier on all the other ones. But this one does have seven, with several seeming to have gotten further. So that could very well be that there are seven tiers, just like there are seven sages. Now, where the eighth sage comes in... That's difficult to say. You. I feel like I probably know the answer already, but I do just want to clarify. What would the what would Midna be the Sage of? The Sage of Twilight. Alright, I figured. Just wanted to make sure. I mean, quite simple. That's a different element in the realm. It exists in its own realm, but it is a realm that is necessary. A big theme of Twilight Princess is how neither realm can really exist mixed together with the other one, but both realms are necessary. Yes. So when these other tribes are uh, sent away, ostracized, Mm -hmm. whatever term you want to use, they're sent to the Twilight Realm? Yes, the Twilight were sent to the Twilight Realm. So there are other But they probably were named something before they were called the Twilight. Because if they're called the Twilight, what, did, did the spirits believe in irony? And it's like, oh, you're called the Twilight? Here's the Twilight Realm. <laughs> and then just flip them off. But no. We have seen other people banished to different realms. Like Ganondorf has been sealed in the Sacred Realm before. But the Twilight being sealed in the Twilight Realm is a little special. And I do have some to talk about on that. You. Wasn't there a Zelda villain named no. Um. <laughs> I mean, you might be close on a name, but no. There's not a Zelda villain named Yiga. Or was there one named Yuga? No. Mm-hmm. Also, I don't know how that would apply to any of this, if they weren't called Yiga. Well, I thought I remembered like the villain who worked with Ganon is named Yiga. So I thought that might be like a parallel. Maybe, but it might just be that they took that name. Yeah. We've seen the leader of the Yiga. He's a doofus. He fell down a big hole. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm glad you brought it up, because I did forget to mention that. We see a key thing about the Twilight Realm. Now, in most of our depictions of the Sacred Realm, it's kind of like this place of... Like, like a place in the clouds, almost. The Zelda universe is very likely not in a normal universe. It might be like a flat plane. <laughs> it might be a flat earth. <laughs> because it is. it does have a creation myth. It does have the goddesses coming down and creating the land. And so, yeah, it could be weird. The Sacred Realm literally could be a layer above Hyrule. But, yes... In Twilight Princess, wasn't there also a species that lived in the clouds that was said to be closer to the gods? I mean, yes, but I think maybe they made that so made that up to make themselves feel better because those things were horrifying abominations, and I think that it literally meant that they were closer to the gods. But they weren't on floating islands; they were on islands powered by fans that kept up. Mm. They were they were weird. I don't like them. Won't be quite far away from the goddesses. If- yeah. But also we've seen depictions of the goddesses before. Yeah. And they don't look like that. They look like they broadly like people. But the sacred realm has often been depicted as this kind of place of floating islands and such. The twilight realm is also depicted as a lot of floating islands. Because in the cutscene that talks about the interlopers and what they did, it seemed to be talking about a time before Hyrule existed, back when all beings lived in the sacred realm. 
And then, when the interlopers tried to claim the sacred realm, it seems to me that the light spirits essentially sawed off the portion that they claimed and cast it away into what became the twilight realm, which essentially is constantly in a state of twilight, like the sun is almost always setting. It's said to, when uncorrupted, look very beautiful, but we've only ever seen it in a corrupted state, where everything's kind of dead and dark and dreary. But, that brings up the Sky Islands in Tears of the Kingdom. Sky Islands, islands are here. Some people said some weird stuff, like some of it, like it floated up or something. But in trailers, we've seen that once Gan's Ganondorf is reawoken and he shoots some big blast in the sky, things descend. So something was up in the air and it's come back down. Or it's just come down. Now, these could also be chunks of the Sacred Realm. Or it could be where the Zonai went. Maybe, someday, down the line, the Twilight reformed. And the world got beautiful. Again, we never got to see what it looked like. It's possible that it was truly a beautiful place before it got corrupted by Ganondorf and Zant. But I guess we won't know until Tears of the Kingdom. Yes. Who's Zant? Zant is a villain from Twilight Princess, but he's not a big part of this theory. Right. Like at all. <laughs> a anyone coming into this has a fair amount of Zelda knowledge. If you don't, I don't know why you're here. Like, I really want to see what this thing I don't know anything about. It. It's like <laughs> it's like if you were like, a, like I really want to know about this character from this game franchise I've never played. Yeah, it's just, that's just my thoughts on the matter. Now, my final big point, the Ganondorf connection. Now, there is technically only one Ganondorf. Ocarina of Time is the first game that introduced us to a Ganondorf. He is a human, Gerudo, incarnation of Ganon. The spirit Ganon has forever been chasing Link and Zelda across generations, constantly attempting to subvert them, subvert their happiness, gain power, take the Triforce, take over the Sacred Realm. Just kind of an asshole. <laughs> That's what he's done. But this time around, he decided to be a little bit more subversive in his takeover. And so, he birthed himself as a Gerudo. Now, I said previously that the Gerudo are exclusively female. That's not entirely true. Every hundred years, the Gerudo will give birth to one man. And when he is born, he is immediately made the Gerudo king. He's the special child, essentially. This rare, rare thing that doesn't happen often. And Ganon wanted to take advantage of this. And it's also kind of implied that his mom <laughs> did this on purpose because they were also evil. They're the twin Nova. Twin Rova. Yes, Twin Rova is the name of Ganon's mother. Twin Rova, however, can split into two beings, and those were said to be like his wet nurses, essentially. So essentially, Twin Rova was one person, gave birth, birth to Ganon in a physical form, and then split to help raise him. Essentially to groom this being into being able to lead the Gerudo to subvert Hyrule Castle and the Hylian people at large. In that game, he comes in, all sneaky-like, pretending to pledge his allegiance to Hyrule Kingdom. Be like, let's put an end to these wars. You know, I'll be a cool guy if you'll be a cool guy. Unfortunately, Princess Zelda immediately sees through this and has visions and is like, that man is literally Satan. <laughs> I can see the devil in his eyes. And then, you know, Link shows up around the same time that Ganon's pledging his allegiance. And she's like, that's the guy. We need to stop him. However, on their journey to stop him, they inadvertently let him into the Sacred Realm, where he gets at the Triforce, takes over power, and ruins Hyrule. <laughs> and then the rest of the game is spent trying to fix that. Now, this is where there's technically multiple Ganondorfs. The timeline kind of splits in two. On one side, Link, at the end of the game, kills Ganondorf. 
Uh, and then he reverts to the demon Ganon to make a final last ditch attempt to just kill the hero and reclaim power. And Link defeats him again. Then that Ganon is sealed away. Just like, you're bad. Go to timeout. <laughs> On another timeline, however, there is a problem. Zelda, feeling bad that she, years and years ago, accidentally harangued Link into this big journey that robbed him of his childhood, offers to use her powers over time to send him back in time so that he can properly live out his childhood. Her idea essentially being... What? I thought it was the Ocarina of Time that sent him back. No, it's her. She uses the Ocarina of Time as a tool. He can't use it to go back in time properly. Uh, right. In Majora's Mask, it's a special exception. Right. Anyway, she sends him back in time to live out his childhood. But he doesn't just live out his childhood. He goes and he warns Zelda about Ganon's plan. And this creates a split-off. Because that timeline where he stopped Ganon in the future and did all that stuff still exists. But now there's this alternate one where Ganon's subverted. In that one, it becomes a huge all-out war. Because Ganon, you know, is like, whoa, 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 whoa. How do you all know my plan already? I planned really good. And then it leads to the sealing of Hyrule and the flooding of Hyrule to essentially keep Ganondorf away from the Triforce and Hyrule and all of its people. Yes? Oh, no. All right. Camera's fixed again. So, where was I? Uh, uh, yes. Hyrule is sealed away. Hyrule's flooded. All the people flee to the tops of the mountains. Ganondorf is kept from getting his prize. Until some upstart, some horrible little kid. What are you doing? Uh, you dropped the battery. With the love of this. Anyway, some horrible little upstart gets his first sword from his maybe grandpa. Oh, you're talking about that. I was really confused. Yeah, they're talking, talking about, about Ganon for a second. Oh. G Ganondorf is just like sitting off being mad in the tower right now. Yeah, Ganon uses spiky. Blades. But unfortunately, Ganondorf, very, very mad about the fact that he can't get his thing, and worried about the return of the princess and the hero, sends out this big bird to look for anyone who might vaguely meet the depiction of Zelda. So any young girls with light hair and pointy ears. This leads, unfortunately, to Link's sister getting abducted because she meets that description. Uh, though, during this time, the bird was already carrying someone, but her pirate band shot the bird and got her dropped beforehand. So, feeling responsible for this, Tetra, the name of this character, takes Link to try and reclaim his sister. This does not go well. Hilarity ensues, and then... This Link stabs that Ganondorf right in the head, and he turns into a big old stone statue. So that splinter timeline Ganondorf, done, gone. Back to the adult timeline, the one where Link disappeared back in time. Or no, wait, this is child timeline, sorry. Child timeline. So. Okay. So. Ganondorf is subverted and sealed away. As part of this, they uh, kind of switch it around a little bit at the end, because in the end of Ocarina of Time, it's just implied that he's sealed away. In Twilight Princess, they kind of reinterpret that. The sages have all kind of gathered, and they are executing Ganondorf. Though, it's a little hazy. Either he broke out of that seal, and then they got him again, and then went to execute him, or they got him and just were like, this time we're just going to execute him. So they attempt to execute him, but unfortunately, the gods see him as really representative of the Triforce of Power, and therefore it becomes attracted to him. So even though they stab him through with his sword, it doesn't kill him, and he breaks free and kills one of the sages. Uh, and then in their last ditch attempt to deal with him, they seal him away in the Twilight Room. They just kind of cast him out, and they don't do it right, so it seems like it just kind of dispersed him in there. 
Over the course of that game, things happen. But once again, Link defeats Ganondorf. But here's the difference. This time, he doesn't turn to stone. He doesn't get stabbed in the head. He just gets stabbed through the middle. And we never see him fall over. He stands back up after being stabbed, gives a little speech about how, like, it's not over, it's never over. My, like, your descendants are fucked forever. <laughs> like, I, you just, fuck you, that's what he says. And then the light leaves his eyes, and he just, and he just stands there. What? Wasn't it Zant? Didn't Zant do something to No, Zant was dead. It was all symbology, my guy. I'll cover that quick because you've decided to bring it up. There's a lot of debate about what happens to Ganondorf at the end. One thing we know for sure. He tries to call on the power of the, the Triforce within him to keep him from dying, but then we see the Triforce fade from his hand. I believe this is due to him no longer being suited to be the representation of power. He has displayed, towards the end, a lot of cowardice, a lot of hiding away, a lot of running, and been defeated soundly many times. He is not a very good representation of power. But at the time, he had two sources of power. He had the twi- uh, sorry, the Triforce, which he got, we see in a cutscene, towards the beginning of this timeline. And we see that he also gets the power of the Twilight. When he was cast into the realm, he learned of the magic from Zant. And was using that magic we see numerous times throughout his appearance in the game to, you know, turn himself into particles, to erect barriers, all sorts of things. Make portals. So after calling unsuccessfully on the power of the Twilight... Uh, sorry. The Triforce, he tries to call on the Twilight power within him. But Zant was his connection to that power. And Zant has died. And so in almost kind of a sickening little thing where, you know, he's calling on this power, but he's essentially trying to call on the power of a dead guy, Zant is there for a second, and then we see a snap. Uh, and then I don't like that you were actually able to make the sound. Yeah, of course I did. <laughs> we see a snap. And then Ganon's eyes go white, the light fades from him, and he just kind of leans over. But we never see him die die. We just see him collapse. We never see that Ganondorf again. Because... he was standing. Yeah, he was standing. He just slumps over. Oh. He goes from like... To... Like that. And just stands there. And it's a very melancholy scene. No one in that scene's happy at the end. Not a single person. <laughs> Link doesn't look happy to be there. Zelda doesn't be happy to be there. It seems like they truly are cursed to do this forever. But then, game ends. But here comes Tears of the Kingdom. And in Tears of the Kingdom, we see a desiccated corpse that appears to have something clutching at maybe a wound at its core, like the wound of a sword. Yes? And isn't Ganon in that scene slumped over like he was when he was stabbed in the head and turned to stone? No, not at all. The storm to stone one was standing up straight. I thought they were, like, standing up like back a little. No, he was like just... standing like this. He had looked up to follow Link as he jumped, but then got stabbed in the head. Right. And then turned to stone. Also, that's an entirely different timeline. Voodoo. Anyway. This Ganon we see, this desiccated Ganon corp, is reared back, almost in agony seeming, with this clutching thing on where a wound might be. That we never get a very clear look at on his chest where this thing was sunk in. But that's where his seal and out from there is pulling malice. Which is this kind of icky force that is born of the hatred of powerful monsters. The mice. No, it's from the monsters. Oh. It says that specifically in Skyward Sword, that malice is physical embodiment of the hatred of dead monsters. And who's the biggest bad monster in the realm? Ganondorf slash Ganon. And I imagine being dead but sealed in eternal agony probably makes you real mad. And thus, all the malice is seeping out constantly. Yes. Wasn't Ganondorf slowly screaming louder when he was killed in Twilight Princess 2? Yes. It's, well, I don't know if he's screaming louder. I think it's that there's kind of like meant to be an implication that 
you know, you got an adrenaline rush, the blood is rushing in your ears, you can't hear very well. But after the stab, as everything kind of calms down, you're starting to hear that Ganondorf is screaming in pain. Right. But yes, that sucks a lot. <laughs> but his mouth was closed when he... <laughs> yeah. In fact, specifically, it opens for a second when he realizes he doesn't have access to the Twilight Power anymore and he's truly dead. And then he goes... And that's it. <laughs> Alrighty. I've played that game way too many times. That's the lie. Not enough times. I want to play it again. I might play it again soon. I got like two different versions of it. I got the superior GameCube version and the, for whatever reason, they reversed everything Wii version, where they decided the easiest way to deal with the fact that Link is left-handed, but most people are right-handed, so they're going to want to hold the sword in the right hand and swing the right sword. Yes. Bringing up that point brings up the fact that this other group, didn't they go through a mirrored realm? Yes. I mean, that kind of makes it a little funny that that, but that's just, that's just how it happened. Yes. All right, it doesn't matter. I was going to say, isn't Link right-handed in the new game, since he holds his sword in his right hand? I thought he was left-handed in this game, but I'll have to double-check, actually. I'm pretty sure it's in Breath of the Wild, not Twilight Princess, though. I don't know for sure. Though. No, no, no. In every Zelda game, Link is canonically left-handed. Oh. Because the original creator was left-handed. I mean, it would make sense to hold your shield in your bound hand so you have a steady guard. No. You want to have your weapon in your main hand. Your left arm just needs to be precise in moving it around. But that's fine, because no game does shield play correctly. Because even though games don't like for you to be able to have your shield up in attack, that's exactly how they were used in real life. You would always have your shield up and be stabbing from behind it. <laughs> because why would you be like, my guts are guarded, and now let me expose them to swing at you? No, just like, that's how you fought. That's just lamer to show that in media. I disagree. I think it'd be really cool if sword combat was accurate in media. Because it would look more realistic. And it was, like, drudgery in warfare. Anyway. Back to this. So, I think what I'm kind of hinting at is pretty pretty obvious. I think that this Ganondorf that we see sealed away deep down in the darkness is somehow related to the Ganondorf we have at the end of Twilight Princess. And I have a second real big bit of proof for that too. Actually, I got a few. First thing. We know at the very least that this Ganondorf is not a recent Gerudo. Because this Ganondorf we see in the trailers has rounded ears, and I believe yellow eyes still. Whereas the current Gerudo, for a while now, seem to have had different colored eyes and pointy ears. So we know at least that this Ganondorf is from a long time ago. Maybe Twilight Princess time area long ago. The other thing we know about this uh, Ganondorf is the form that his demon self takes. In Twilight Princess, after you expel Ganondorf from his possession of Zelda at first, he takes on his dark beast Ganon state. And in this state, he appears as a giant boar, four-legged boar with big tusks, and he charges at you through various portals and such. In Breath of the Wild, after you defeat the Calamity Ganon, the beard, big blight Ganon construct that he made out of Malice, all of the Malice from across the kingdom pools together as Ganondorf, or at least his essence, makes one last attempt to win. And it takes the form of Dark Beast Ganon, which looks like a giant boar with big tusks. And that might not seem significant, except that Every other depiction we've seen of Ganon looks a little different. In Ocarina of Time, Ganon's form was this boar demon. It had big tusks, but it and was pig-shaped, but it was clearly this demon. It wielded two giant swords, and it had this tail, which was its weak spot. Because <laughs> you gotta have a weak spot in Zelda games. And that was that. In other editions, he is just like this big pig demon thing. 
Sometimes has a tusk, sometimes doesn't. Mostly just has a pig visage. Dark Beast Ganon from Twilight Princess very specifically was this bestial boar, this giant boar. And in Breath of the Wild, when we have a Dark Beast Ganon again, it takes that same form. Being this bestial boar versus any other form. It, if it was a completely different form, that wouldn't fit my theory as well. But it's specifically near identical, save for the fact that it's made of pulsating malice, to Dark Beast Ganon from Twilight Princess. Yes. And we're... Hey, don't you deal like the first blow to Ganon on his underside where he was stabbed? I'm not sure about that, but if that's the case, which I'll have to double check, that makes it even better. <laughs> because first blow, right where the original of this Ganondorf had that big wound in his chest. Where the bacon comes from. Where the bacon comes from. I wouldn't want to eat Gan bacon. I feel like it would taste like arsenic. What do you mean? It'd have, it'd have like a nice sandy texture. That sandy texture is not what you want on flavor. meat. You don't want sand. Do you flavor? Sand doesn't have flavor. It tastes like sad and dry. Look, just because you guys didn't eat sand doesn't mean everyone didn't. Are your teeth okay? Yeah, perfectly fine. Why do you ask? Are, are they like polished pebbles or something at this point? No, fairly sharp. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so the reason that that is important to this theory, oh. Uh, the Twilight and the Zonai being one and the same, is because if this Ganondorf is somehow even tangentially connected to our Twilight Princess Ganondorf, which it seems to be the case, given that he has many similar appearance bits, and the fact that the bestial state, the Ganon, the demon form that that one produces, looks very similar to the Twilight Princess one, this would be a fairly meaningless connection if you're going to not bring back the Twilight in some sense. Especially given all the other little hints we've got. We've got the mirror next to the Zonai encampment. We have the shadowy, shrouded place. We have the similar architecture, the similar color and energy, and similar mythological-seeming worship of dragons and other beasts and such. And that brings one. I do just want to clarify real quick. I didn't put bumps of sand in my face as a kid. <laughs> I would be out like oh, a, you did. I was there. No, I'd be out like a beach or something, and sand would go into my mouth while I was in the water. Yes, it'd go into your mouth while you was in the water because you scooped it and brought it in. Anyway, also something I noticed was that in Tears of the Kingdom, or at least in the trailers I've it's seen. It's not sounding a lot like a question, but go on. In the trailers I've seen. We haven't gotten a good look of Lurlin Village, where the zone, where the believed Zonai descendants are. Well, we haven't seen a lot of good looks at many villages, save for Castle Town, which seems like it's being rebuilt. Which and I imagine the castle shooting up in the sky is going to put a big damper on that, but whatever. But yeah, we don't see a lot of the villages, but that is something to bring up, especially given that one of the first shots in one of the newest trailers shows us exiting that what was a pitch black ruin, but now it is perfectly lit up. So, all of this coming together, the fact that we got the rule of threes, which means that if we keep following it, we got the Sheikah with blue, we got the Yiga with red, and we have two green represented Sheikah downfall tribes? Probably not, they're probably the same. We have the importance of eyes, we see that just like how the Sheikah and the Yiga had red eyes, the Twi'lai also had red eyes, heavily implying that the Twi'lai were a fallen Sheikah splinter group. We have the fact that all of them seem to have some connections to shadows. We got the fact that the art and architecture is strikingly similar, that headpiece from Midna being my best piece of evidence because it looks damn near exactly like that Zonai line, uh, what was it, the Maztec lines? 
The Nazca lines. Nazca lines. Like the Zonai's Nazca line things. We got the fact that each had their own form of advanced magical technology, all of which used a kind of blue-green energy. We got the fact that we have clear ties in Tears of the Kingdom to the idea of the Seven Sages, with the Tears being our new medallions, having representative colors, and we haven't seen all of them, but given that we already see Azora with the water tier or water medallion, a Gerudo with the spirit tier or medallion, Zelda having a, having a tier that has the symbol that means time in this game on it, and we've seen another yellow tier, which is probably the tier of light, and we have seen the green tier, which would be the wind medallion, held by someone with wind powers, making that connection back to the sages. Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, immediately connected. Same Ganondorf, both of them not fully dead. We got the idea that Midna could have been an eighth sage, and there was seven hero one statues with an eighth one built, hidden away, and completely mirrored in texture and model, like indicating a mirrored image, mirrors, twilight realm, behind a mirror, and then we got Big Boy Ganon. Why are the Dark Beast Ganons of both of them exactly the same? And therefore I have proven, without any doubt, that the Zonai and the Twilight are the same.